Hello and thank you for joining us for the first instalment of Care Conversations. Before Jan, our Chair of the Workhouse Network, introduces the session properly, I just want to go over some practicalities. Um, we are recording this session to be later hosted um, on our website, however your video and microphone are automatically turned off so you will not be shown. Please use the chat function for any comments and please use the Q&A button for any questions to our panellists. Both buttons for these functions can be found at the bottom of the screen. So without further ado, on to Jan. Thank you, Emily, and thank you for being a super engineer. She is our engineer for the day. Fantastic. So I'll introduce myself and then I'll introduce the other panellists. Uh, I'm Jan Overfield Shaw. I'm the chair of the Workhouse Network, which sounds grand, but, you know, we're really... A a bit more of a collective than that these days. Uh, and I'm the Senior Partnership and Programme Officer at the uh, National Trust Workhouse and Infirmary in Southwell. Um, I was going to do a really quick uh, introduction about what these care conversations are about, and they'll be over the next three Saturdays, and they approach the encounter between contemporary issues such as homelessness, learning disability and mental health, and the histography of the workhouse system, the poor law and the, that legitimised that process, and the poor law boards and guardians that maintained it. The history of the workhouse system, more importantly, the people who lived and worked there have something to tell us about the centuries they inhabited and that their views and practices can also help put the present in a critical light and hence contributing, hopefully, to its transformation. So we'll be doing this by exploring the stories of people who are living through the experience of poverty, poor health and disability, and recognising similar stories from the period of the workhouse, 1820s to 1948, or the wealth, beginning of the welfare state. We are not aiming to solve anything or directly compare and contrast, say, vagrants and homelessness. We want to explore both to find a commonality and genuine ways for the network and other muse all the museums that are involved in the network to work with contemporary issues that surround poverty. Uh, so that, that's what we're all about today. And uh, I'm just going to now introduce Belinda, our research volunteer from, I've got to get this right, Thackeray Museum of Medicine. And they work from the workhouse, uh, which is the building which was formerly the Leeds Union Workhouse. So over to you, Belinda, and uh, introduce. Sorry, I need to unmute, yeah. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm uh, Belinda, as she uh, said. Um, I come from a background of family history. So I started doing my family history on uh, using various websites and records um, in 2004. Uh, and got involved with um, the uh, Workhouse Project, More Than Oliver Twist, uh, through a link with a local uh, history society. Um, I'd moved back to Leeds and was researching my family, so I was very interested in whether any of my family uh, had any connection with the Workhouse. Um, and I just got more and more involved in the stories uh, that I found, which led me to doing, uh, as well as online research, research at West Yorkshire Archives. Um, and what I found is um, I am a carer, uh, well, my brother is in care. Um, I have spent some time um, looking after him, but he's now in a, a care home uh, as he has Parkinson's and needs um, a greater amount of care than I could provide for him. Um, my parents also uh, were in the same care home at one point because they both had dementia and they passed away um, fairly recently uh, over the last few years. Um, so there is a connection for me in how people um, get through periods of illness when they can no longer be cared for in the home and how they're protected and how the funding is arranged and so there's that connection um, but more than that as well there's a real I have a real interest in finding out about people who 
uh, I suppose we could say are on the margin, who we don't normally see documents about. And the astonishment that you can actually uncover uh, details about people's lives who um, perhaps are completely forgotten. Um, people without children, um, who, or who, the, who their families may not know anything about um, the things that they went through. So you're looking at their lives and feeling uh, sympathy um, and remembering people who hadn't been thought of um, perhaps for a hundred years, um, you know, more. Uh, and I find that really touching. I think it's interesting to look at people's lives in this way. You, you can do that. Um, you can find out about how people lived or you begin to empathize with them in a way that's different from somebody who is ab about now because that intrusion isn't felt. I don't feel that intrusion that I would if I was looking into, you know, your life. Um, and um, that means I can, you know, I felt a great deal about about the people that I've, I've researched and been very interested in how their lives um, pan out really okay is that fine <laughs> that's more than fine that's fantastic a great start actually and um yeah the the passion of all our researchers is is astonishing i, I love that idea about that intrusion and i think that really pins what we're trying to do here is to find out how we can as museums approach uh, those communities and those people experiencing that often in isolation so that that's a really perfect point there Belinda thank you so um, moving now to introduce Jess and Matt founders of the Museum of Homelessness uh, the it's a museum based in their community. Uh, I think we have so much to learn from their practice. So they're going to introduce themselves and here we go. Thanks so much, Jan and um, Belinda and everyone in, in the Workhouse Network. It's really, uh, it's really lovely to be here with you all today. And we're also looking forward to learning a lot from our conversations. Yeah, hi everyone. It's uh, really good to be here as well. I've uh, been involved with the Workhouse Network for a little while now. I think Museum of Homelessness has a, I mean, in a way, because we were set up about five to seven years ago, many of the long-standing kind of cultural, social legacies of the Workhouse system, we negotiate uh, as part of our uh, work as a museum. Um, so we have a kind of unique relationship with, uh, with a lot of the Workhouses uh, and Workhouse Museums as well. So it's something that we uh, deeply interested in. So we've got um, we've got some slides. Should we should we share a little bit about the museum's work, particularly in the last year? Okay. Um, to start off, and then and then we can have sort of further conversations. Um, I'm just going to try and share screen. Sorry, we're not that Zoom fluent. So. <laughs> oh. Okay. Can everyone see that? Cool, it's worked. Okay, <laughs> amazing. Thank you, Matt, do you want to start? Yeah, it's really good, to, thank you. Yes, Jess, oh. um, it's really good to have this opportunity to speak. We're gonna talk for like about 15 minutes a bit about the Museum of Homelessness and yeah, uh, and hopefully have a discussion afterwards. Um, I want you all just to quickly um, call to mind an image of homelessness, if, if you can. Um, it could be anything really. Um, I just want you to kind of ponder that for a couple of seconds. So you might have thought about the streets, you might have thought about typical sites where we see rough sleeping happening. You might have thought um, about attitudes or the idea that people affected by homelessness are outside of society, uh, are refusing uh, offers of help perhaps. Um, uh, you may have thought about accommodation, um, for example, the lack of housing. Um, there are a lot of narratives, a lot of um, representations about homelessness that happen, which are very disempowering. Um, they often picture people in quite passive uh, positions. And um, in this talk today, we really want to kind of offer a diff different view of that, really. Um, one which speaks to the tenacity of people, that speaks to their ingenuity, their resilience, um, because that's what we have found 
in setting up a museum of homelessness, which um, works with and for people di uh, directly affected by homelessness. And in your own uh, research and interest into workhouse history, you'll be coming across really rich life histories. It's something that Belinda's already mentioned, uh, which are incredibly powerful and moving. And I think there's a lot of that spirit alive in, in our own organization, the Museum of Homelessness today. So in this image here, um, you see a group of people uh, where they're um, early, very early Christmas morning on Trafalgar Square, Christmas Day this year in a deserted West End. Um, and we were out with our, what we call our homeless task force, which we'll explain more about as we go through. Um, but in this image as well, this group of people, it's not immediately obvious who's homeless, who isn't homeless, who's lived in poverty, who's never had to worry about money. And there is a mix of people in that group, um, all kind of working together to make something happen. And that's something that we find in our history and in our archive and it's something that we embody today um, and it's something that we're really proud of. A bit about us, um, so we're a London-based charity, um, myself and just are the co-founders of the museum and we were, we've kind of been growing up as a new museum in a time where there's been rising levels of homelessness in the last decade. Uh, an interesting thing to say about us is that we don't have a base, you can't like visit the Museum of Homelessness seven days a week. Um, so that's something that's important to, to kind of recognise. So as we've been kind of growing up, we've set up a lot of different projects, um, working with people in different ways. We're very volunteer driven. Mo many of those people have experienced some form of homelessness at some point. Um, and I think that's meant that we are really driven by the direct need that we see around us. So the museum is informed by like two things. Basically, it's informed by its archive and its history and it embodies its history. And we'll explain more about that. Um, but it also, because it is, the museum is like filled with people who are homeless, uh, who are deciding what the museum does and, and being the museum every day. Um, it embodies those qualities that we might find in people who are homeless. Um, and in these images here on the bottom left, you can see some of our archive materials being workshopped into an exhibition we call our historic work, um, This Stuff Matters, and we make exhibitions where the material is interpreted by people who are homeless and, and shared with the public. Uh, on the bottom right, um, one of our storytellers is telling a contemporary object story. We collect stories of today as well, and that's being performed there at the House of Lords. Um, and at the top, you've got the Homeless Task Force, again, which I'm going to talk about. Um, and these kind of three strands of work, we recently won the UK Civic Arts Award for um, from the Calusa Gombengian Foundation. So that was last month, and we were really, really proud to get that. So the qualities that we're going to talk about, three qualities, we've got adaptability, courage, and creativity. And they are three qualities you will find in marginalised people everywhere. Um, they are also qualities in our museum. So first of all, we're going to explain a little bit about how adaptability has informed the museum's work in the last year. Um, so there's obviously a bit of a London theme with this presentation, particularly a bit of a focus on the West End. So you'll have already seen an image of Trafalgar Square. There will be other streets near to Trafalgar Square featured in this presentation. But the adaptability, to talk a bit about that, it's worth mentioning that over the last year, our normal museum activity, our, our heritage exhibitions, our, our creative work with artists, for example, all of that's had to kind of go on the back burner. Um, and it's really started um, in early March. We were running a, a drop-in, running heritage workshops uh, in a community centre in Islington, one of the many temporary bases that we've had to work with over the last few years. And we were doing a sort of like a breakfast club for people who were sleeping out on the streets. Uh, trying to get people interested in our in our project and it became very clear uh, very quickly as coronavirus sort of burst onto the scene that there wasn't really safe spaces for people who uh, are homeless to self-isolate uh, and it wasn't really immediately clear what people should do. Um, this was so kind of extensive this sort of sense of confusion that we actually bought a digital thermometer in boots on one of the mornings of the drop-in uh, to actually take people's temperature as they were coming into the into the drop-in um, and this actually um, began a kind of real period of intensive thinking and discussion within the groups we work with within our relationships with homelessness charities uh, people in our museum of homelessness community uh, what do we do about this um, and it, we began to sort of 
it became very clear that we needed to find safe spaces for people to isolate in. And these images here show some of our social media campaigning, some of the press we were able to get for this campaign. And it was really saying we need money and support to provide safe spaces, hotel rooms, so people can self-isolate effectively. There literally wasn't a plan at this point. There was silence from like government. So we, we developed the plan, published it. And it was good that the BBC could pick it up um, Absolutely. And this eventually morphed into what has become known as Everyone In, which is the hotel plan um, that has been adopted by councils around the UK to bring people inside. And 37,000 people have uh, been offered some form of temporary accommodation during the pandemic as a result of this. And we're really pleased to have played uh, a small part in that, making that happen. Um, Continuing well, the adaptability <laughs> theme. Then we adapted into a local response. So... Um, <laughs> like towards the end of March last year for lockdown one, the council lent us a temporary community centre and we changed it to an emergency hub, recruited 50 volunteers, uh, the task force that I mentioned. Um, in the bottom left of this image, you can see um, a stack of shelves with loads and loads of crisps on them. Those crisps came from the roundhouse when they closed down for lockdown, they sent all of their crisps and snacks from their bar to us in a black cab. Um, the shelves that those crisps are on are our creative residency shelves, so they were museum shelves that we repurposed for food. And um, we did a seven day a week emergency operation in lockdown one where we got food to people who were newly accommodated in North London via the Everyone In programme, because the councils found accommodation for people, but there was basically no other supplies, so we filled that gap. Um, and then we also worked with people who were left on the streets. And there were people who were left on the streets um, and it was a really bad situation like um, I remember quite early on no one could get access to water and people who were homeless were having to drink out of like the toilet system in the park um, so we ordered a truckload of water and made sure that we got that out so you know it really was a matter of very upholding people's very basic human rights at that stage of the pandemic and doing whatever is needed um, you might not expect a museum to do that stuff, but actually, when you look around the UK, loads of museums and arts organisations did step up to this type of work and did whatever was necessary for their communities. Um, and that's really lovely. We're, we were really proud to be a part of that. And, uh, uh, and it, yeah, it's just a really fantastic aspect of the sector, I think. And courage. So this is the second quality. Um, it takes courage, obviously, to to send, you know, to for the organisational courage was required to take the risk to send volunteers out into an unknown pandemic. And our trustees were amazing because they signed off that plan in 24 hours. They were just absolutely brilliant. And it really works. I think we really were able to do some good stuff um, because of that attitude to risk. Um, but there's a lot of there's basically this quite long history of courageous people who are marginalised stepping up to do what needs to be done. And that's a history that's less documented, but it's a history, a set of histories that we have evidence of in our archive. And um, it was really nice that Belinda was talking about family history earlier. And I know maybe for many people in the network, family history is an important part of it. Um, and it is for me as well. So. This image here is of uh, people who were homeless in the West End in the 1950s, late 50s, comes from our archive. Uh, and the person in the tall white man stood near to the tea van with the hat. That's my dad. Uh, he was street homeless for like years and years and years and years, and then got involved with an organization called the Simon Community uh, and ended up founding his own community of homeless people creating a different way of being together. And that's where me and my brother were born. This picture was taken long time before he met my mum and we were born. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it's a very important part of our history. Uh, and the, the, the things that he did as a homeless community organiser really, really inspire us today. And there's one story that he always tells about um, it's in, the, it's in the archive. This is a, a piece of uh, that's in the archive of Simon's scrapbook, which documents the early to mid 60s and their movement. But he always tells this story about um, 
they used to hose down people who were sleeping rough on the Strand and on Villiers Street near to that tea van. And they campaigned against this, um, but the authorities would keep hosing down people to move them on. And it was, you know, it was pretty inhumane practice. Um, and so they hatched to plan him and him and his pals and uh, the other, some of the other homeless men. And um, they used to uh, jump on the fire engines at the Aldwych end because they were using fire trucks to, for the water to hose people. And so my dad and others would jump on the fire truck, open the water tank. So by the time it got to Villiers Street, the water tank was empty and they weren't able to hose down the people sleeping rough. And he used to tell me that story as a little girl and I used to always find it really inspiring. Um, this winter lockdown, we were really proud to work with the Simon community. So this is uh, me and Matt um, and Katie from the Simon community. We teamed up to do cover the West End four nights a week during lockdown, getting supplies out to people. Uh, the very same streets that my dad lived and, and slept on and, and battled with the authorities on. Um, and that felt really special to us and it felt really right. You know, um, my dad and Anton, the founder of the Simon community, they used to call it the mission of the misfits. Um, so this, uh, we used that hashtag this winter uh, because, you know, it, it just felt like, it felt very much like that again. One of the things that happened this winter was that um, the council hosed down people's sleep sites. So one of the people we were working with, Martin, who was absolutely amazing, uh, he reported to us that, they, that their sleep sites had been hosed down in Covent Garden. So we supported Martin to campaign on this and secure some press around it. Um, and, and really it was about platforming Martin um, you know, to tell the story and, and to campaign rather than us coming in, taking over. Um, but we tweeted about it and things like that. And then we, because we thought it was so out of order, I think um, what we need to explain about this winter, it was so tough for the people that were still sleeping outside. Uh, a low point for everyone was us having to source cardboard for people because lockdown shops were shut. They weren't getting recycling, so they didn't even have cardboard to bed down on the streets, you know. It was very, very desperate. Um, nowhere to warm up in the day, nowhere to dry your stuff if it happened to get snow on. So for, for them to be hosed down, we we thought was really inexcusable in that lockdown situation. Um, we reached out to Liberty, who we work with sometimes. They advise us on legal things and they allocated one of their human rights lawyers to it because they felt that the activity was a breach of human rights. Um, so that caused quite a stir then, and in the end result, the activity stopped. So the hosing down and filming of people um, stopped for the rest of the winter, so people were able to have more peace um, in a very, very difficult situation. So we were really pleased with that, and, and most importantly, Martin was really pleased to have the support um, and to have that result because some of the activity had been going on for 16 months beforehand. Yeah, thanks, Jess. I think that's, uh, I mean, no street, Southampton Street and Covent Garden where Martin was, and uh, Villiers Street uh, off the embankment where your dad was, and Trafalgar Square. These are just, these are places which are just literally two or three minutes away from each other, these streets. So there's just so much history, and um, that's just a snapshot, really, of how our own organisation relates to that. Um, I'd like to add, really, that it is, although the, the, the slides so far have shown kind of a lot of work at street level, um, we do a lot of work uh, around the whole homelessness system. So very often that pertains to uh, temporary accommodation as well. This isn't an image of temporary accommodation. It's of a, of a vigil that we set up to remember all the people who sadly died whilst homeless in 2020. This is a project we run called the Dying Homeless Project. It's a memorial project. We have a memorial page on our website, uh, which remembers uh, all of those people. Um, and we inherited that project from another uh, news organization uh, who started it up in 2017. It's a very powerful project. And some of the, we are remembering people, but we're also finding out a lot about the flaws in the system. And a huge number of the flaws are occurring in the temporary accommodation system where people are being brought allegedly inside to safety, but are often placed in very risky situation, very precarious accommodation, um, which subsequently doesn't uh, work out all too often with sometimes tragic consequences. Um, so I, we are inspired to do that work on the temporary accommodation system through the people we work with directly. 
you're looking at here an image of uh, a hostel or a hostile, as he uh, refers to it. Um, and um, it's there are lots of places like this in uh, cities like London and elsewhere. Um, cramped accommodation, this is a converted bathroom. Uh, and someone we work with who's been involved with the museum for a very long time now, um, I spent a long time on the streets. Um, we come off to the streets into, into a temporary accommodation placement. And this was where it was, it's in uh, North London, this hostile. Um, this converted bathroom is up several flights of steps, um, which makes it very difficult for him because he has a lung condition. Uh, and it's not accessible. It, the window overlooks a smoking shelter um, and it's obviously next to a radiator, which he was unable to switch off because he couldn't control, it couldn't be controlled from his room. Uh, so um, the conditions in this room are, are pretty, pretty bad for an elderly pensioner. But he got himself out of this situation by basically creating an adult safeguarding alert for himself, um, <laughs> which he used to advocate with the, the social workers in the council um, and he's very literate in terms of certain legal frameworks, particularly around the CARE Act. And effectively, I think, more or less scared uh, the social workers into offering him a new accommodation placement, um, which he's subsequently taken up, and that's where he is now. Um, but he kind of had to do this because the situation was so sort of precarious. He lived there for the best part of a year. Um, and he was the one who really would get onto us about temporary accommodation. You know, this is really bad. The Care Quality Commission should really be regulating these uh, these places. And that's something he actually pushes for a lot. It's a message we've put out there. And when you look at situate, you know, individual sort of examples like this, you can really see why. And that is now being is now being talked about in Parliament, isn't it? Yeah, there is the, a uh, regulatory system for accommodation. But we thought this might be interesting to people because this really is the type of um, setting that has, you know, replaced the workhouse really um, for the contemporary period. And it's, unfortunately, we, we do have the evidence that, you know, we documented in a year where everyone came inside, the everyone in year, unfortunately, we documented a 37% increase in homeless deaths. The vast majority of those deaths were in accommodation. And I think the impact on people's mental health, um, the isolation people can feel, uh, and but also the, some of the physical attributes like Matt has described. You know, I think people, sh we should have a society where people are safer when they're in the care of the state than they are on the street. And at the moment we don't have that. So um, this community member has taught the museum a lot um, around creative resistance, creative use of legislation, et cetera. Uh, and, he, you know, it's really been an amazing education working with him, hasn't it? Absolutely. Um, and some of, uh, some of the responses to the hostel system are, are different. This is one of our artists, Gob Skewer. Um, we popped this in because they are performing at the place Bedford on May 21st. So if anyone is in or around Bedford and, and can make it to that, it's an outdoor COVID safe performance of a show that they've created called Provoked to Madness by the Brutality of Wealth. Now, this show is like a one person, um, brilliant uh, theatre performance, and it is based upon their experience of when they were in a hostel and a support worker, which they always use the inverted commas, um, said to them, what do you need books for? You're homeless. Yeah, they were being moved, weren't they? They were being moved and they were carrying, they had a broken arm and they asked them to help carry these books. And they said, what do you need those for? You're homeless. And um, uh and they, they, uh, Gobskill says that they have very long, they had a very long revenge process for this, which has involved, um, uh, you know, self-education at the Open University, developing an artistic career, culminating in this show. Uh, and when you see it, it really is a joyful, um, creative, a beautiful um, clapback to this comment that was made by a support worker. Um, so that's it from us. I think what we wanted to just finish with was is this quote from Shoshana Zuboff, who's a, a brilliant theorist, looks at, she actually looks at tech and the impact that's having on our lives. But um, this quote, she's where she describes what ha happens with power over history, we find really inspiring. So she says, these are eternal themes of knowledge, authority and power that can never be settled for all time. There's no end of history in each generation must assert its will and imagination as new threats require us to retry the case in every age. Um, and so history does repeat itself and power does, does this throughout history. And we know that the archive and our research tells us that, but rather than get depressed about it, we can find you know, strength in these 
creative responses and uh, in the communities that we find ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Words uh, escape me from that. That is just, I've been following you on Facebook, but to hear it there from you and your uh, resilience, creativity uh, is, is, is astounding. So, and I have worked a little bit in the homeless sector um, uh, before I worked in uh, the workhouse uh, because I felt that I wanted to get further into this. So that is, uh, uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we will be keeping that and using that a lot. <laughs> so thank you. Thank, thanks so much. Um, OK, so we're going to go move on now into a little sort of questions sort of session. Uh, I want to keep it really uh, um, quick. Uh, so here's the opener, really. Um, in the historical setting of the mid-19th century, working people emerge uh, as a distinct class, often portrayed in Dickens as victims with no agency. Their only escape from destitution and often each other in that sense was being rescued by a middle class benefactor. So that's where more than Oliver Twist came from and how we wanted to start to reverse that view. They're seen as victims. So when in reality, this is a period of emergent and increasing powerful working class movements, such as the Chartists, pre that, the Luddites, the Mirtha Rising, the Tolpoddle Tol Martyrs, so, and more. So um, the question first is, what's the stigmatisation that Museum of Homelessness community face? How, how is that kind of uh, idea of victims? I mean, you've, you've turned that around for us in that in that presentation, but uh, just to sort of clarify that a little bit. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know, I think it's a good, I, th I think it does endure, doesn't it? That uh, idea of people as, as a victim. Um, and that that really resonates um, th that, you know, the concept that the middle class savior must come in and, you know, like, it's just so interesting that quite often we kind of see the op the opposite to that in our work. So the the that resourcefulness, ingenuity, um, that, that people develop is survival skills, isn't it? Survival skills are, are a, a, an amazing set of things that I think everyone can learn from. Um, what do you think about that, Martin? types of oppression that people are facing yeah. i mean well i mean it's embodied obviously in the in in the legislation legislation that people are coming up against so uh just to cite a few examples if you have a housing case then it's intentionality is the uh it's one of the tests five tests they give you if you're so if you've made yourself intentionally homeless i feel that that pertains to uh ways of thinking about uh, your situation, which go back to the poor laws of the, of the 1830s. Are you deserving or undeserving? And that's embodied in uh, the 1977 Housing and Homeless Persons Act. So people to get housed, that's created a system where uh, a single homelessness system, which is um, people who are, have no dependents, very often don't qualify. So you get uh, a real, so that's why you have a lot, large, a lot of provision from homelessness charities around that catering for that because of that gap in the legislation so there's a lot of um stigma that emerges as a result of that so there's a legislation that's a, a legal way in which it happens mm -hmm. but the social and cultural norms around homelessness persist today so just thinking about media representations for example um around homelessness often very very uh well often are very very um flattening they're very reductive um around people's identities and i think um sort of paint uh, often paint a picture of a, of a passive person really yeah it's either it's the two main stereotypes are the passive victim who is begging or needs a help um or the deviant person who's refusing refusing all offers of help and just doing their own thing um and um that, you know that they're they're a nuisance to society and so the vagrancy act speaks to that because it deems people to be nuisance who are deserve to be hosed down because they're not conforming. Um, so I think those are the kind of the two 
the two things that people will mainly face. There's, there is still a lot of fear around it as well. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, just to go, it's so, something like the 40 Days on the Street documentary, Ed Stafford documentary, for, I mean, a perfect 60. 60 Days on the Street, a perfect example of that kind of uh, approach to homelessness, which is looking to sensationalize things, create an image, a picture of a sort of underworld. Um, and the reality, the people who are going, who are on the streets are going in and out of services, going in and out of accommodation very often. Um, so there's, one of our artists says, you know, when he was coming out of homelessness, he was asked, uh, what does it feel like to be rejoining society? And his response to that was, well, I never left. I never left society, you know, and that's actually the reality on the ground. So I think it's cultural, social attitudes, and obviously legal barriers that, that keep these things going. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Belinda, do you, do you hear resonances in that from your research? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's... Um... The workhouses were, um, well, the the workhouses were when uh, when people went to the workhouses, they went for a number of different reasons, um, and they were segregated. So um, the we have now this stigma about workhouses, and certainly that's something that's been shown a lot, um, but. The reality was as well that they did provide uh, security uh, for a lot of people who could no longer uh, maintain themselves. And the research I've done is the predominant number of people, uh, you know, the, the way that the, uh, an elderly couple um, who'd um, worked all their lives, um, they could end up sharing a, a room together, whereas um, you know, sort of uh, people who are classed as vagrants would be kept in a vagrancy ward. So there was a, a difference between how people were treated within uh, the care home, uh, the, sorry, the care home, their, their workhouse. So for many people, it was a care home. Um, but there are examples, as I say, we think of these dormitories, and yes, there were dormitories. There was segregation between men and women. They were separated out into different wings of the building. Um, the children were separated out to a school. Um, and uh, people with mental health issues, they were separated out into a different building. So in somewhere like Leeds Union Workhouse, which was a state-of-the-art workhouse when it was built, it, uh, it and then grew to accommodate larger numbers of people with mental health and larger numbers of individuals. Um, and uh, also the hospital, the, uh, you know, sort of St. James's Hospital came out of that, all because, um, you know, the way it actually developed was, there was an awful lot of people in there who were elderly and could no longer work. So I wonder how much of a stigma it actually was um, at the time. Um, sorry, I, I lost my thread a little bit <laughs> at the beginning. No, that's fine. That's great, Belinda. And, and that's quite an interesting question that you said there, like, uh, does that, that, stigmatization of this uh, system that's there create um, a stigmatization because it identifies us and them. So is that where it comes from? So if we're not in the workhouse, we're deserving, we're fine, we're, and, and clearly not, <laughs> clearly not in the 19th century, but it, it defines, I think uh, Foucault in, uh, and, and maybe Deleuze is, uh, talk about it as machines. They're machines of culture that they create a particular space in which we can identify they are other, they are other than us. So um, I think that's the role that workhouses uh, play in this uh, narrative that's grown uh, a little bit. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I mean, go on. I mean, that I've been banging on, and, and, and people have quite rightly uh, questioned my view uh, that we should no longer refer to people as paupers. Because although I accept completely that from an academic point of view, the word pauper is a word that technically described the people who were in there, we could also say that of imbecile. Yes. Um, and, and I think. For my purposes, and my, my discussion of what is happening in the workhouse, 
I'd rather talk about residence uh, because that is a contemporary word that we all understand and refers to me as just as much as it does to you, Jan, Jess and Matt. We are people who are accommodated within a building somehow. We're residents of a building. Now, okay, that mm. doesn't, even if it's only for a night, it's not a all encompassing terms because obviously the homeless are not included, but in my area that I'm looking at, I'm predominantly looking at people who are in the workhouse at that point, some of whom are homeless and some of whom are, well, as I, as I say, the, there's an awful lot of uh, elderly people in there. Mm -hmm. It's more like a care home, I should imagine, mm -hmm. for a great number of people. I mean, there's a couple, um, there's a couple, um, uh, the Batemans, uh, whose names I've forgotten, Thomas and Ellen. Thomas and Ellen uh, married in 19, uh, 1830. Um, he was a shipbuilder. They married on St. Michaelmas Day, which was uh, a festival for shipbuilders. There were, uh, he was drunk. He tried to get out of his marriage. Two weeks later, he said he was drunk. He didn't want to marry her. It was in the newspapers. And um, the, the judge said, you know, you've got to maintain it. You've married her. That's that. And they lived together then for 50 years. They traveled up and down the canals where he had different mm. work. And by the time he was, oh, goodness, 60, uh, no, hang on, 80. Let's have a little look at him. Uh, if you just bear with me a moment. Um, yeah, by the time he was 74, he was in the workhouse. They were both in the workhouse and they're listed together on the census. This is a strong indication that they were accommodated together, that they had this shared space. Mm. They'd been together for 50 years after that terrible start and they were living together and they died within six months of each other in uh, Leeds Union workhouse. You know, so these people had worked their entire lives and he was, uh, it said on the census in 1881, he was blind. He'd been blind for two years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's 74. He's been blind since 72. You know, what work he could have picked up, we don't know. We don't know exactly when they the went into the, to the workhouse. But this is, these are ex exactly the sort of people that you see an awful lot within the... They work up to a certain point, And then when they can no longer work, the, the workhouse is no longer... Uh, you know, is the only option for them. Hmm. Um, now, do you want to, me to talk about, um, uh, res you know, how the uh, responsibilities, uh, how it was funded at this point, or are we coming back to that? Yeah, I think so. I, I'll just pick up on that labelling that uh, yeah. we'll, we'll get to. So if you want to talk very quickly about that, funding and the system uh that would be great and uh we can then invite jess and matt to respond to that yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. just a couple of minutes bro yeah, you, yeah, yeah. i'll be as quick as i can so um another uh uh we don't always know if there's uh what the funding arrangement was um but we we do know that there was a system uh, for funding um, people who went into care, uh, in, into the workhouse. So if you uh, went in, the, uh, the poor or guardians would look for a member of the family to support you in the workhouse setting. So it wasn't that you went into the workhouse and then the workhouse paid for everything. The workhouse would look to recover that money uh, from uh, relatives who were able to support them. And this was uh, in their view to stop people from just farming out their relatives that they didn't want, you know, that they, that, you know, just get rid of them. Um, the responsibility, and I think this is important for what various governments have talked about recently, the responsibility was within the family to support that individual. However, there were a number of factors that uh, affected this. One was the closeness of the relationship. So fathers, um, brothers, uh, sons are predominantly the people who they're looking at. It had to be a close familial relationship. They weren't going to cousins. They weren't going to your great aunt. You know, they were going to immediate members of the family. And there was what was called a tree of responsibility. Now, I can't show you this at the moment because I haven't got one available to me. Um, but there is there is one in the West Yorkshire archives from 19... 
um, I think it's 1917, which uh, which shows that that you know that that tree of responsibility was still there, and it showed you precisely who you could and couldn't recover money from. The other consideration, of course, was whether or not the person could afford it, and their means would be assessed. Um, so for the case of Martha Horrocks, Martha Horrocks was born in Keithley um, and she had six children. Um, Henry remained in Keithley and in 1881 he was still in Keithley. So he's sort of out of the picture a bit. Um, her second son, William, um, eventually became an architect. But at this point he was sort of a builder's clerk type of person moving into the architecture sort of side of things he was quite entrepreneurial and he he had teenage children at this point so obviously he'll be saying we can't have her at home she's got uh we, I've got these teenage children the house is full um Alice um had passed away by 1881 she was classed as an imbecile and she had been in the Keithley workhouse re uh, records um, uh, uh, and she'd been in, in the workhouse probably from about 1861 to 1871, or probably until she died. Um, Anne had got married. Joseph was a cooper and he was living in Leeds. He also had uh, six children and a boarder living with him in 1881. So they were a packed house. Um, and his, uh, his, the youngest daughter, Martha, she had already died as well, but she'd also spent some time in a uh, workhouse in Keithley. So the family had already had workhouse experience. In fact, I think that William had been in a workhouse, which is probably where he learned to read. Um, so going on, 1881, the poor law guardians were looking at William and Joseph, the two, um, sons who were in Leeds at the time who were both working for a maintenance uh, agreement and they um, so they met with them and then they came up with a maintenance agreement which um, defined how much each one of them was going to pay towards her keep. Uh, so we know as well from other records that Martha did live with uh, she definitely lived with Joseph for some time. She may have lived with Henry and she, um, William um, became, um, uh, mentioned it later on in life that he'd looked after his destitute mother. Okay. Um, how one could refer to your own mother as destitute it, is extraordinary. Well, that, that's where that labelling comes in, yeah. isn't it? And that process starts to define how we think about or, you know, how we uh, gauge that or how the system gauges it and how we've absorbed that into the culture. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Belinda. I've actually learned quite a bit about that. I, uh, we always refer to the parish, but that's been really fascinating, that uh, research into the family tree of responsibility. Matt, well, it, oh, I, oh, before we go, can I just yeah. say it is interesting that I have not found anything about resettling her. I mean, the resettlement okay. paper, uh, papers are not available to us, so we, we haven't got those anymore. However, I think it's because she had two sons in Leeds who were working that they didn't try and resettle her back to Keithley. Right. So, Jess and Matt, do you have a, are there resonances in that tree of responsibility? Uh, yeah, definitely. And uh, uh, that is really fascinating. Like mm. our, our, our archive is 20th century. So it's so amazing to hear such detailed um, research really about, um, you know, re really about the community, very similar communities to what we're operating in now. Um, and the idea of resettlement is really important um, for for people today so local so so basically when um what will usually happen if someone is uh, sleeping rough and then um someone either from the council or a homelessness charity funded by the council makes an approach to them to offer help nine times out of ten it will be a ticket home right yeah. they call it single mm -hmm. service offer um and the local connection rules which date back 
exactly to that are still very, very strong. They still really dominate the idea of, um, it's like the idea of responsibility for for individuals is geographically um, defined. Yeah, it's the act of settlement. The acts of settlement, you know, and it's linked to funding, who's going to pay. So that is really fascinating uh, research too. I, I would really love to see a tree of responsibility as well. Um, just thinking about family responsibility and kinship networks and how how that works. Um, did we did we want to talk about labelling? Was that one, of, or do we want to answer some of the questions that are coming up in here? Is that yes? That, that's your tree. Yeah. Can Go I on, see you Belinda. Go on, let's have a look, Belinda. Oh, amazing. Oh, that's really cool. I'd love to have a proper look at that <laughs> at some point. Yeah, um, I, I have got it on there, so I'll try and... Uh, it's it's from the West Yorkshire Archive, so I'd have to know... Uh, this is from 1907. Okay. Uh, and it's from... Uh, it's actually from a newspaper, I think. I think it was published in a newspaper. But I've also got a rather fabulous letter that is about vagrancy and about resettlement, and I'd really uh -huh. like to share it with you. And this is a first for me, so I'm going to have a go. Um, You're screen sharing? Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, <clears throat> it's the green button on the bottom. Yeah, I press that. Uh, oh, goodness, where are we going? No, I don't want that. Okay, this could be problematic. Uh, hang on a minute, I'm trying to find it. Desktop one, open system preferences. Okay, do you want to talk amongst yourselves while I just try and work out how to do this? Do we quickly answer? Um, yes, could we Yeah, move on questions. to the chat and uh, questions? And we could also perhaps uh, talk about how we do continue sharing this and sharing this information and mm. uh, create this uh, way. So I'm sure that um, Belinda can send you this information uh, and email you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to step back now and allow Emily to run the uh, the chat. Thanks very yeah, much. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Belinda. We'll find a way of sharing, I'm sure. Um, thank you, uh, thank you to both of you, uh, all of you, for that. It's been really interesting to listen and learn so much about the past and the contemporary system. So thank you very much. Uh, we've had a few questions from the audience, so I'll get to asking those now. Um, so one question from Megan was, how do we consciously undo the social constructs that are embedded in her childhood education and media? How can we overcome the fear of the other that has been created in the lower within today's society? And how can we give ourselves permission to make mistakes in this type of work? So it's kind of three questions in one really, um, but is there anyone who'd like to answer that one? I think some of this is to do with um, um, uh, learning a little bit about how we work as, as a society, as individuals. So um, we did a project a couple of years back called Objectified, which was looking at uh, some of the social neuroscience behind how people uh, experience dehumanization. So how we can effectively shut out a person, um, which is a sort of a neural defense mechanism we all have. It's how we cope with stress. It's how we cope with something which is unfamiliar to us. Um, and we wanted to do that in relation to homelessness, particularly uh, rough sleeping, because there's a lot that happens around that. So we did a project which looked at some of the humanizing aspects of an interaction, which um, can lead to people not experiencing that sort of level of stigma. This is why um, one of the, we, 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 with a lot of our creative work, we do something called object storytelling, where someone who's homeless gives us an object uh, with an interview, and that interview is retold in that person's words, but there's something very humanizing about an object, a museum object, because it's a personal belonging and your route to that person's narrative. Uh, you don't know that person in the story, they're anonymous, but you hear, you hear the story of a thing. It could be a cup, it could be a pack of cigarettes, it could be a, a, an art piece. So you learn your route into that person's story is much more humanizing as a result. So um, I think more of that in our representations about poverty, exclusion, uh, and homelessness is really, really essential. That's what we try to do. Mm, museums are set up to do it. So basically what the neuroscience tells us is that stories um, stop this stigmatization, uh, like the, this part of the brain that uh, helps this part of the brain light up, which humanizes others. Um, so obviously in the museums and cultural sector, we're set up to really help 
this process happen and to create those connections in society. So in terms of giving ourselves permission to make mistakes, I think we just have to be real with people and, and be, if you're, if you're honest with people and the trust is there and then you can make mistakes and we can, you know, we can all learn from each other. We just put out a new like um, access and inclusion statement and it actually says in there, we do not always get this right and we don't and none of us can. Mm. Um, and we felt it was really important to write that in there, but we always try our best and we always try and learn because that's all any of us can do, isn't it? It's just keep learning, you know. Yeah, I think that's so true. I think you have to, the most important thing is to try. It's better to try and get it wrong and then not do anything at all and just leave it. Right. It is. Um, so yeah, that's really interesting that you have that in your in your mission statement as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've got a, a, sorry, Belinda, do you want to say something? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to agree with that. I mean, I remember seeing um, at the um, museum, of um oh goodness uh, the warfare national uh, imperial war museum um and they were looking at children who were um, um evacuated during the war and you were getting these little letters you know handwritten letters and and handwritten uh, with photographs of people and just by having an object there and perhaps a teddy you know sort of actually the the objects the teddies were a way in to feeling sen about those sensitive feelings. I think we're addressing with the sensitive feelings that we feel when we're dealing with a problem that someone else has that is more than we could bear or more than we think we could bear. And I think that it is easy to shut off. Um, and I think that you're absolutely right by introducing you know, the, the, the foundling uh, children's hospitals uh, you know, little items um, mm. and uh, handwritten letters that we find in, in the, the workhouse or a reference to Christmas decorations. I mean, the, there was there was a letter about Christmas deck. I know this sounds irrelevant, but there was a reference to Christmas direction uh, decorations in the committee mi uh, minutes saying, you know, well, next year we're not having nails putting up because it's ruining our cornices and or whatever, you know, we're not having any of this. <laughs> and then you sort of like next November, there's another note in the minute. So we've appointed, we've asked the, uh, we've uh, asked a joiner to come in to put up some hooks for the Christmas decorations. It's like every office you've ever worked in. They're always <laughs> like, you can't do that. But that touch, that moment of reading that, was like these are people who are working together they want to put the christmas decorations up for each other they want them there they want to have a happy christmas together and they're, they're talking about how they're going to put the nails up in the walls because it's not allowed that to me spoke volumes about how things actually are in that place and it's a little way a little sneaky slip into um the humanity of the people who work there yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I agree. That's really interesting, actually, Belinda. And I think what is interesting as well is that when we've been doing this research and this work in the workhouse network in our in our previous project, that we haven't had a lot of objects that we've been able to kind of focus our attention on. It has been more sort of researching people's stories, and um, even without objects, you can still find that emotion and that empathy with these people as if you start sort of researching them and kind of what our researchers were doing and what you definitely did Belinda was um kind of claim a, a person as their own and then um <laughs> and then carry on and then tell their story and it's just really interesting um that it was just fasc fascinating really to learn about all these people um so we've got a few more questions sorry Belinda we've just got a few more questions from people um so um it says uh, the hostile room. So when, I think this is from when your presentation, Jess and Matt, um, the hostile room reminds me of vagrants, ward, vagrant ward cells and shares an element of judgment and punishment for those who have a different lifestyle. Are there other ways this judgment is expressed today and in the past? Uh, yeah, numerous ways. Um, I think really the, the homelessness system over the last uh, 50 years has become very uh, casework, uh, very professionalised, very casework orientated. Um, and th as a result, um, you do have the systems very conditional for people. So to come mm -hmm. off the streets, um, you have to be verified. Uh, and that is a, there's a whole story around how you become a verified rough sleeper um, to get a street link alert 
verified by a team and then you go into accommodation. You uh, just mentioned the single service offer, which is a 72 hour offer that's given to people. And you may be offered a local connection. Uh, you may be offered uh, an option to move to go to a space, a hostel space, which you may know actually. Um, and you may know people in that space. You might not want to go there um, or it might work for you. Um, then you might go to that space and then you've got to begin a journey of um, effectively getting onto benefits and so forth and so forth. So it's, um, it's, it's not always, you know, it's a one shot system. It's, a, it's seemingly straight, quite straightforward, but doesn't work for everyone. And there are lots of little biases and uh, mm -hmm. barriers built into it. So say, say if you're, say if you're struggling, um, say if you're struggling in early phase of alcohol recovery from alcohol addiction. Yeah. And then you get placed in a wet, uh, you know, um, shared accommodation where you've got your own room, but everyone else in the house is actively drinking. That happened to one of our community members. People don't stand a chance. So, you know, they're, they're talking now about um, one of the judgments that comes in is around people's mental health. And there's some talk now of replacing the Vagrancy Act um, with some legislation that gives outreach workers the power to section people if they refuse an offer of coming inside, right? Now, personally, for me, if I was on the streets, I would rather have a fine and a criminal charge than be sectioned against my will. We have to ask, are we replacing that archaic uh, legislation with something that's actually more harmful? Because when the offer is so detrimental to one's health, as we said earlier, there's evidence people are dying when they come inside, is it really mad to refuse that offer? Or is the person who's refusing the offer the same one and is it the system that's mad? These are the sort of questions that we're exploring in, in mm. our work at the moment. And there's a huge variety. So there are, you know, there is so much variety in the type of provision. There's some local authorities who are amazing and they do it really, really well. And there's a, like a network of charities built around that local authority and they work together really, really effectively. Um, and you, we, there's lots of really positive examples uh, it's from, not all from the last year, particularly around the Everyone In program. Yeah. I think that's had a revolutionary impact on the way health services, housing departments and local voluntary groups and charities all talk to each other. That's always been a problem. So it's, there's a lot. It's a constant question um, that's always being explored. Um, but yes, yeah, still lots of biases, still lots of judgments built into the system, sadly, that we work mm. on. That just sounds like a deprivation of liberty uh, approach, doesn't it? You're just depriving somebody of their liberty by uh, sectioning it's, them like that. That's just extraordinary, it's a bit dark. isn't it's quite it? Dark, dark. Isn't it? God, yeah. bloody hell! Mm. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just needed to no, say no. that. I yeah. needed to say that. Okay. But I'd rather keep the Vagrancy Act. Thank you very much. Which is what yeah. <laughs> madly. Saying, this yeah. is very interesting. <laughs> You are being recorded saying that, Jess. Well, You'd rather keep the vapors. Yeah, just for, yeah, I'd rather, only in that context. God. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um. Um, so we, I think we're, we're, we're about out of time really, um, but there's one, a quick question for Museum of Homelessness was, um, it looks like you're mostly based in London. Do you have other sites as your, or basically does your work spread across the country as well? Yes, as we've Yes, just to quickly answer we, we that. We spread. We, we've, yeah, we've done projects in other cities. Um, we don't have a building of our own. Um, we have a sort of temporary office space that we're moving out of and, in, and a new space we're moving into. So we've never had a building. We're looking for one in London. We've worked, done lots of other projects in other cities, um, which we've done a bit less of, obviously, during the pandemic, but we continue to, to try. And we've worked in, uh, we worked in Glasgow. We've worked a little bit in Leeds. We worked with um, the um, St. George's. Uh, we've got some object stories, from, amazing object stories from one of the team there. Um, we've done Liverpool, Manchester, but over the pandemic, we focused well, hyper-local, actually, North London, um, which I think everyone's world did shrink a little bit, didn't it, in the last 12 months? Really interesting. Um, yeah with strengths and challenges within that brilliant awesome um i'll just hand over to jan to uh wrap up this session well again i feel a little bit <laughs> out of words i think this has been the most amazing session and um i think it's going to be great for the website uh i really think that there's so much more conversation that we could have with you jess and matt and i hope vice versa uh, you know that there, there's plenty of rich uh, territory here for, for us all. And I'd like to thank all the people who part came 
up and everyone who put a question up thank you very much and I'm going to be actively pushing this <laughs> this session out and using it in my my uh, museum and I hope that uh, everyone connected with the network will be doing that so it will have a much wider reach as Emily said right at the beginning thank you to Emily wow look at that timing we're just five minutes out that's just astonishing and uh, again Belinda you're, it's just fantastic to hear your not only your historical stuff, but you, your insights and how you see that and how you perceive that. It's, it's just so rich. Yeah, really, really great. And Jess and Matt, thank you so much for your time. I know you're just uh, in the middle of crazy stuff and moving and <laughs> nobody does this on a house move day. What are you doing? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so thank you. And uh, I'm sure we, we really, all of us want to continue this conversation. So thank you yeah. very much. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Bye bye. Um, bank holiday. Care, bye. Oh yes, that too. <laughs> <laughs>